All right, so Benji. Hey. Yesterday, you left me with a huge tease. I did. You I were going to explain everything about the universe to me, and then you stopped. I mean, I wasn't going to quite explain everything, everything about the universe. I was promised everything. I was going to answer Merman's challenge. And okay. just to like reiterate what was happening, right? We went through how, um, you know, when you have entanglement, there is a... We, we talk about you know how science eventually develops from collecting small theories that describe just kind of the data itself and how to predict from one data point to the next data point. And it naturally evolves into this principled thing that says, I can say this is what's going on about a, the universe. And because of that, this is the data that we see, right? We shift from just describing things to using principles that we can, that, that we to it or develop guess at and then use that to predict how the universe will look like and then when we match that up against the data see oh hey look that principle is a fundamental principle of what, about what's going on right we talked about with that with special relativity about how the speed of light being measured the same no matter how you look at your light source if you're in an inertial reference frame you will measure that the light from that source is coming to you at a particular speed and it doesn't matter how fast or towards the source or away from the source you're going, even though, you know, our intuitive senses of how, you know, velocity sh should add, in fact, don't add that way when you're dealing with light, right? Um, and then we talked about, well, okay, we have kind of the state of quantum mechanics is describing the data. We have a very accurate theory about describing, okay, if I know this data point, I can get to the next data point. But there's a fuzziness about that theory. There, there's the questions, conundrums in that theory that we can't quite explain. Why is this happening? Why is it that I can't fully predict? I can't understand sharply with quantum mechanics. What about the universe? makes it that way and a lot of physicists stick with no no we have a good enough theory to predict what's happening that's fine that's good enough i don't need to do anything more the role of science is to make predictions and better understand how to control the universe but there are plenty of proponents out there who say no we should try to do more we should understand what is happening in the universe around us, right? And Merman kind of, uh, a gentleman by the name of Merman put together in, I believe it's a paper in 1982, um, put together this challenge where he describes a device that you could build with statistics that match what we met, what we see in quantum mechanics and said, okay, how do I explain these two things, uh, these two sets of data, how do I reconcile them? And you, you can translate attempts at explaining the universe in a, in a sharp way, local hidden variables, to this. And we see that they fail, or actually, no, excuse me, I'll show you that they fail, to accurately reproduce what the Merman device is, right? And we showed that this device could, in fact, be built physically, right? The stern Gerlach machine, this, this guy up here on screen. If I have, if I set up effectively two Stirringer like machines with a source in between this, where the uh, particles are entangled, I will have Merman's device, right? And the last thing that we did was show that, okay, with a Stirringer, like what you're really measuring is making a measurement on what the value of Planck's constant or Planck's constant divided by two pi a quantity known as h bar just for mathematical convenience and the thing that we will deal with now Planck's constant is now h bar not Planck's constant fair enough yeah it's it's the mathematical trickery of saying the speed of light is one right it makes life so much more convenient when you have one instead of you know three times ten to the eight Ugh. and actually you know a number that actually requires all of the digits to fully uh to accurately describe Instead, so we say, no, 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 we will measure and define our uh, our systems of measurement so that the speed of light is, in fact, one. Which makes the universe look a little weird, but it's fine. It's fine. So, in order to properly walk through the math, uh, properly show how Merman's device uh, is distinct from the idea of instruction sets, of the, the idea that... At the source of the particles that are sent to two observers, we'll call them Alice and Bob, we call them Alice and Bob, at the source, 
that they agree locally there how they're going to be read, right? Whether um, with, with Merman's device, right, we gave, there were three ways that you could measure it, settings one, two, and three. And when that translates into the stern Gerlach, that translates into measuring, you know, on the vertical axis, uh, then 20 degrees off of that, and then another 20, 120 <laughs> degrees, and then another 120 degrees, right? Three settings for your full 360. Right. Right. So one of the things that the, the fundamental object in quantum mechanics that we're really always dealing with is a thing called a correlation function, right? And a correlation function effectively is a, just telling you, okay, how likely if I observe this thing, what's the relationship to a second thing that I could be interested in? It's so fundamental. It's, it's the one piece that when I generalize quantum mechanics to try and be in harmony with special relativity, the thing called uh, quantum field theory, it's the one piece that survives. For example, right? If I draw for you a little... A Feynman diagram, Ooh. right? Everyone's heard, not well, I won't say everyone's heard of these, but you might have heard of these, right? If I have a Feynman diagram here. So what this is telling me, if the time moves in this direction, right? What this picture is telling me is that what is the correlation between an electron coming in from this direction, a positron coming in from this direction in this point in, in uh, time, right? So this axis, the bottom axis is time, and then here we have, you know, space. What is uh, the, this is a way where they interact together, create a photon, and then that photon creates a positron and electron moving out. Right. This is a way of calculating the correlation between two the antiparticles, the photon, the, excuse me, the electron and the positron interacting, annihilating and then re uh, re emerging out. This is a way of describing quantum, the quantum foam is what you'll hear it called as. Um, so this takes place all the time everywhere. Exactly. OK. And this is mathematically, this picture was a convenient tool to calculate what the, uh, the um, correlation function is between an electron and a positron at those points in time with those momentums, right? It's, it's a tool of saying, okay, if I have particle, particle A and particle B, how, what's the most likely way they're going to interact? And by creating different Feynman diagrams, right, the ways, the possible ways that they can interact, I can go ahead and calculate, you know, the probabilities that are associated with that and then get the overall average behavior. It's the, this is a way of describing the correlation function. It's the fundamental tool for quantum, quantum field theory and there, and eventually quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics, the, the theories that we use to describe quantum electricity and quantum and the strong force, um, which is quantum chromodynamics. And it's the most accurate theory we've ever produced. And it's all based on this correlation function, this simple mathematical tool of saying, oh, if I have, you know, a particle over here or an interaction over in this spot, what's the likelihood that I'll get an interaction over in that spot? That's it. The correlation function is an incredibly powerful tool for making predictions and making these calculations. So what do you mean if I have an interaction on this spot, I'll have an interaction on that spot? So, or, well, actually I should, that's a colloquialism I'll say, uh, by what is the likelihood if, let's say I, these, these particles having these momentums do in fact interact, right? I have to say, okay, they'll interact in a way here, this Feynman guy around tells me that they interact in a way that produces a photon and then eventually sends out two particles, right? Uh, now, do they have less energy on the right side? As far as QFT will say, no. Or Yes, yes, they have the same energy, both coming in and out. But they created a photon, a photon was created. So the uh, photon was created, but the this is describing annihilation. So 
the photon is created, remember this is time, so if I look at this moment, right, I've got an electron and a positron. If I look at this moment, I have only a photon, no electron, no no positron. So the two particles, the electron and positron, are what are called antiparticle pairs. They have the same mass, but different char electric charge. And when they interact, they annihilate and convert into pure energy. In this case, they convert into a photon. And that photon has, the, is, has enough energy to then eventually, later down the line, later in time, split up again into another particle-antiparticle pair. Now, it doesn't have enough energy to become, say, a muon and its part antiparticle. Those are he that's a heavier particle, basically a, a fancy heavy electron. Um, and it doesn't have enough energy to create that pair, but it does have enough energy to create the electron-positron pair. So eventually it will, or at least this is the Feynman diagram describing that process, right? Mm -hmm. I could come up potentially with other with other Feynman diagrams. Because, for example, what happens if you have a annihilation event and that get, that photon interacts with another particle before it, before it you know, right. pair produces, right? And those are, whenever you're trying to do the calculations in quantum field theory, uh, that's, those are the kinds of events that you have to take into account, right? Could another particle come in? Um, what's the likelihood based on my initial conditions, etc.? cetera? Like here, when I am taking into account all of those pieces, right, it creates this very, very accurate theory, and it's all based on this idea of a correlation function. So what is the correlation function going to look like for our setup? Well, let's say we have the... Let's remind ourselves what the Alice and Bob setup looks like. So and import this, right? So, in the Stern Gerlach, right, we have Alice over here. Let me... Come on. There we go. And for those who aren't familiar with the Stern Gerlach, we actually discussed this, I believe that'll be three episodes ago. Uh, we discussed that a little bit here. We discussed that. We discussed that at the end of the last episode as well, where there, you know, you've got a spin... Basically, uh, particle particles act like they've got a little bit of magnet, like they're a little magnet, and then when you send them through a big magnet, they'll either be moved up or moved down based on whether that little magnet is pointed up or pointed down. And I'll li I'll link to the video that the Stern Girl Act was first brought up. In. Yeah. So Alice and Bob, right? We have Alice's Stern Girl Act machine here. We have Bob's Stern Girl Act machine there. They're going to have particles that are sent to them from the source. And they have freedom over what direction, right, the, the, the you know, the stern girl like machine is oriented in, right? If, for example, we'll, and we'll call the angle from the vertical that they choose. Uh, for Alice, we'll call hers alpha. And for Bob, we will call his beta. And when you say the angle from vertical. So, let's say... This would be alpha equals to zero, the way that Alice currently has her stern girl -like machine oriented. If she rotates it some degree, let's say mm. 30 degrees, right, she will effectively be measuring along that axis. And so this would be alpha equal to 30 degrees, right? Okay. Same thing with Bob, except we'll denote his as beta, right? So what we are interested in as as we were describing with the mirror machine, is we're interested in the fact that when Alice and Bob have their alpha and betas both set to the same measurement, so in the case when alpha is equal to beta, we have the statistics from case A, which, you know what, since we did this an episode ago, let's go ahead and remind everyone the statistics we had which we found right over here. Merman's, Merman's device gives us the statistics on top here, which says that when Alice and Bob have the same measurement, alpha equals beta, that they will agree 100% of the time. They will see, you know, two, um, they will see either both up or 
uh, both red, both green in Merman's language. Uh, for the stern Gerlach, uh, it depend it will depend a bit on the particle that we have, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but they'll both see either up, both up or both down, or there are somewhere they'll see one will see up and one will see down, and vice versa. Uh, and that correlation holds all the time as long as they happen to measure at the same direction, the same choice. If, for example, Alice decides to measure setting one, which is alpha equals zero, and let's say Bob measures setting two, alpha equal to or beta equal to 120 degrees then the statistics that they'll see, according to Merman for his device, is this. They will agree a quarter of the time, right, one-eighth of the time for seeing one measurement, one-eighth of the time seeing the other, and they will disagree uh, three out of four. And this, again, this has been experimentally determined already. Right. Okay. This is, this is what, if you set up, right, this, where did I put it? If I set up this uh, setup and send out, you know, say 10 particles and then to both Alice and Bob and then Alice and Bob come together and compare their results and say, oh, okay, on the first one, I measured in this direction and got this result. And Bob says, okay, I measured in this direction and got this result. The statistics of how off of what they will find follow this guy up here, right? Mm -hmm. This top piece, the Merman device. And the proposal of, okay, how do I explain, the, the challenge was, okay, how do I explain this, right, the case A, the agreed settings, and still get the results of case B, right? The uh, traditional, uh, the initial idea was that, oh, okay, we have the instruction set, let's per perhaps, perhaps the particles agree at the source, what they should measure based on which or which way they're measured, whether they're measured based on the vertical, the setting to 120 degrees or 240 degrees off of the vertical, right? And what Mermit finds, right, is that the statistics, while you can get the statistics for case A when they agree to match, there's an implication when you try and calculate, okay, what would they see in case B? the statistics are different, right? If you have the particles agreeing at the point where they're created, okay? So, so the, there clearly is no conspiracy between the particles. So that's the argument is that, okay, if, if the particles were able to agree, right, then they would have the statistic, but instead we see different, right? So how are we going to... They're, they're right. So, so that's just the experimental data. Let's show how this falls out in the theory itself. And like I was saying, the important piece is the correlation function. Okay. So the function that we're going to consider is what's the correlation between alpha and beta. And this will be very simple. It is going to be the sum across uh, all possible results i and j of and just the multiplication of i j we'll get to what that is in a second uh multiplied by the probability of getting some result i and j given i know that alice measures at angle alpha and bob measures angle beta so what are the results well this here this is the probability that Alice gets I, so Alice measures result I, given uh, that she put her stern Gerlach at angle alpha, and sim and simultaneously, right, or rather for the same event, Bob will measure result J when his orientation is at beta. So what are the possibilities for i and j? Well, they're simple. They can either be plus one or minus one, right? These, or, these orient to uh, the picture we have over here, where the stern Gerlach will give you either a spin up particle or a, spin, a measurement of a spin down particle. And that's as best as we can do according to quantum mechanics. So when we are looking at the math, right, i and j, 
that is the results that we can have. Uh, so what we know for uh, having just looked at the statistics for both Merman's machine and the instruction set is that in case A, right, when both Alice and Bob agree uh, or happen to measure the same angle that the... So alpha equals beta. Yeah, when alpha equals beta, that the correlation function is equal to 1 for both the Merman device and the instruction set. Right, we were, and, and then that kind of shows in the statistics itself. We were able to reproduce via, you know, we were able to reproduce Merman, the Merman device statistics using instruction sets, which is that they are always correlated. You will always measure, you know, the correct thing, uh, the thing that you would expect to see, right? They'll always agree, mm -hmm. right? So the differentiating factor is case B. What happens when they disagree, right? Now, if you remember, right, we were describing that the instruction sets took the form, which I'll abbreviate here, the instruction sets took the form of three, uh, three letters, right? And it would be, for example, right, red, red, green was the particles would agree to measure red when asked their measurement along setting one. They would agree to measure red along setting two, and they would measure green when asked their their measurement along setting three. Right. That's how uh, the instruction set would work. If I have. So here, what's important is that there are two agreeing letters. And this is the worst case. Uh, scenario. So what's the correlation function if I have two agreeing letters? Let's, and let's... to be clear, it's the worst case scenario because if you remove the R, it has to be a G. Right. So, so you're still going to have two agreeing. So so here, for example, the, you right, you can you can't have right if if there's only uh, if there's one unique letter, then there the other two clearly have to be the same, right? Pigeonhole principle. And if I have uh, an instruction set where all three agree, then there's no way that Alice or Bob get a different result. Right. So here, this instruction set is the only way to guarantee that Alice and Bob will, in fact, have a potential of having different results. Right. If, and I, sh I, I, I need to specify this actually now that I think about it, is that if only one instruction set of the possible eight, you know, different combinations of R of R and G with three different slots, right? If only one of them is the instruction set the universe tells the particles to agree upon, or if it is the only instruction set that the particles do agree upon, right? We have no information about, uh, as far as the, this proposal about instruction sets, we have no information about, you know, which ones they, which ones they would choose. So you're saying there's even a possibility, or I don't know, you're saying that we're we're excluding the possibility that the one particle chose one instruction set, another one chose another one, because we know the particles are entangled. Uh, yeah. So, so fundamentally, the the idea of the instruction set is that uh, to describe this entanglement, so that if the particles didn't agree upon an, a, the same instruction set, then we wouldn't be describing the entanglement phenomena. So I have to. So they have to agree, otherwise right. there would be no entanglement, and you wouldn't get you wouldn't get case A if they didn't agree upon the same instruction set, then even if Alice and Bob did measure the same, happen to measure the same angle, they would get differing results. So it's not describing the phenomena that we see in real life, because if Alice and Bob do happen to measure the same angle with their stern Gerlax, they will see 100% agreeance all the time. And that's a weird thing, right? That was something that bothered some of the founders of quantum mechanics, as we've talked about, as is a, a wonderful talking point for pretty much the entire scientific community, right? Mm -hmm. So, the worst, if, if I'm trying to calculate, um, if I'm trying to calculate correlation functions, the worst result or the strongest result that I could get for a correlation function is, if I had alpha, beta, so, wrong symbol there. So, well, let's just expand what this you know abstract structure looks like it's simply saying okay there is a result where both 
in terms of spin, right? So plus one, minus one. And to be fair, we could put this in terms of just the Mermaid Designs and say that red is plus one and green is minus one, for right. example, right? There is a result where well, I'll get plus one and plus one, where both Bob and Alice measure a spin up particle. So just we're saying plus one is red yeah. and minus one is green. Right. So they can agree they can measure and agree, oh, okay, we both saw red, or we both saw spin up, or plus one. All equivalent statements, right? And that will occur one out of six of the possible ways that they could measure, right? Now, they could also agree, right, because they have to agree a third of the time at worst, right? We discussed that last time. They could also measure both minus one. So minus one times minus one. And that they can measure one-sixth of the time, right? In addition, they could disagree. Alice could measure, let me put a plus here. Alice could measure plus one, Bob could measure minus one, and they'll do that uh, in two out of the six total possibilities, or the opposite result, which is Alice could measure minus one, and Bob could measure plus one, and that will happen also to out of the six possible terms. So now I've gone through all six possible orientations, all six possible results, right? I'm One, seeing two. some negative signs here, though. Yeah. And so what that's going to tell me is that, okay, the correlation function is that they is negative one-third. So if the, if the um, instruction sets are always chosen so that they agree for two of the letters... Lift that guy up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I always forget. About, I always forget about the table. It's hard to <laughs> conceptualize yeah. what it looks like here. If uh, if I have the instructions, that's where they agree to, and that's the only one that the particles ever agree on, then they will be slightly anti-correlated when you look at two different measurements. To to when when you are asked when Alice and Bob measure along different axes, when alpha does not equal beta. Okay, so just so we're clear that the negative one third correlation applies to case B. Yes. Okay. Right. We are we are exclusively in case B, where Alice and Bob are measuring along different axes where they where alpha doesn't equal beta. The worst case of case B. Yes. Right. Right. The the most anti correlated, right, which here is going to be a correlation function that gives you a negative result is a indication of anti correlation. Right. If it were negative one, for example, for this cor if the correlation function gave you negative one, then you would say, oh, okay, red and green are anti-correlated, which would tell me, which in, in order to construct a correlation function of negative one, it would mean that Alice and Bob always disagree on their results. That when Alice measures red, Bob would measure green. And that's going to be, is that even possible? Uh, we'll get there potentially. It depends. It depends on how you're me like what particle you're measuring, um, and I'll, and I'll get to that distinction here. But that still will only happen, even physically, only happen in case A, because you can have two mm -hmm. particles that agree with each other or two particles that always disagree with each other. Right. 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 Depending, the depending on the type of entanglement. Right. right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, if if I have um. If I have a matching correlation set, right? If, you know, let's say I pick the the thing that the particles happen to agree upon is red, 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 then the correlation function that I would see for that, don't know why my brain is like, no, you need to parenthesize there, would be, let's say red is plus one, I would have plus one, plus one, all six out of six times and everything else would be multiplied by a zero so your correlation function would be plus one right that would be if the instruction set is always one that is you know the three letters in a row mm -hmm. right they will never disagree and so so here and the, this is the this is actually the lower form we've talked about bell's theorem before about how you can construct a, a, a bound on what you should be able to, like the, the probabilities you should see, or a bound on a special function, if 
the things you like about you know locality and non de non super determinism and outcome independence are all true we can construct mathematically uh, a bound on what it would look like and when we dealt with that you know a couple episodes ago that was in terms of this abstract function that they ha that it happens to give a very nice like oh it must be two mm -hmm. but you can also do this Right. What we've literally done is created the bell inequality for the mermaid machine. If instruction sets are true, then the most anti-correlated that the particles can be is negative one third. And if I find that quantum falls between the range of negative one third or positive one, then I can explain the the phenomena of quantum mechanics, the phenomena of entanglement using instruction sets. Or at least no one can say you're wrong without further Correct. clarification. Right. Okay. Right. I would need I would need to find another way of measuring. I, I couldn't rely on entanglement as the thing to distinguish between quantum mechanical phenomena and classical phenomena. Right. Right. Now, interestingly enough, if if instead of the particles conspiring to pick just one instruction set to always agree upon, if instead they always uh, pick randomly and pick randomly from all possible, you know, instruction sets equally, then the correlation, then, then what you'll end up, right, is an equal choice, right, between the possibility of measuring, of Bob and Alice measuring red-green, or green-red, or red-red, or green-green. And what that means is, you know, an equal possibility of minus one, plus minus one, plus plus one, plus plus one, which... You know, if I if I say, oh, okay, alpha, beta is just, you know, minus one times one out of four possibilities, and minus one out of one out of four possibilities, and plus one out of one out of four possibilities, and plus one out of one out of four possibilities, that's just going to be zero. So if I assume the least amount of knowledge about how the universe actually picks the instruction sets in this theory. Well, and it makes sense the correlation would be zero because you've randomly chosen. Right. Exactly. It's, it's that, um, right, it is if the universe does agree upon does agree upon some gentleman's agreement between particles about how they're going to respond when asked what they measure, but... You know, the idea of local hidden variables is that information is beyond our, our reach right now. We can't quite measure it. Then the only, only reasonable or the most principled way to approach that is to say, well, let me just assume that they pick a, a equally, equal at equal probability, right, between any possible agreement that they could say, because that's the only way to not bias my results. This kind of jumps back to the um, maximum entropy principle for when you're deriving different theories, for example, statistical mechanics, as we talked about in my uh, candidacy talk. It's that, oh, well, if I don't know how the universe picks it, the best I could do is to say, ah, it's a flat probability, right? Um, so th what we will assume is that the universe picking from the instruction sets equally and randomly uh, is the correct interpretation of the instruction set. So I expect... If, if I were, if instruction sets were to be true, I would expect to have a correlation function of zero. But even, even so, the worst anti, the, the, the range of possible correlation results, if you, if instruction sets were true, again, would be between negative one third and plus one. So if quantum mechanics falls outside that, then instruction sets have a problem. Okay. And so what we can do is using the, actually, let me just go ahead and import it once more. Using the results of Merman's device, I can construct from here what my correlation function should be for the Merman device, right? So case B, fact two so in case b the correlation between alice's angle of measurement and bob's measure angle of measurement they will agree 
let's say again let's say red is plus one so they can agree on plus one plus one according to here one eighth of the time they will agree on minus one minus one one eighth of the time they will disagree They will disagree where Alice sees red and Bob sees green, or plus one, minus one, three-eighths of the time. I think that's this guy here. And they will disagree where Alice sees green or minus one and Bob sees red or plus one, three-eighths of the time. So now, the moment of truth. We simply multiply this out, add it up, and ask ourselves, what does it equal to? Well. This equals to, won't go through the math too much, negative one half. Now, I'm here going, whoa, because, but, but let's put that in context. Negative one half, remember, uh, when you have fractions, right, one over a number, when that number is smaller, it's in fact bigger a fraction than when, you know, the number's bigger. So one third is smaller than one half. Mm -hmm. And when we have negative numbers, right, that means... A bigger number is more in the negative direction. Well, we're definitely outside the bounds of the local hidden variables possibility. Exactly. So with neg so with the result of negative one half, I am outside the inequality, the minimum result of correlation that in that the instruction set interpretation would allow. So what this tells us is that the Merman device is more strongly anti-correlated for different settings than the instruction sets are. And even even in the even in the situation where I constructed my instruction set so that it gave the most anti-correlation possible, which was you know having two settings agree and one disagree, with the assumption that we didn't want to bias the results. Well, no, no, no. Uh, that's that's the if, if if I if I if I had insight and knew that the universe always agreed upon one instruction set, then. That's the most anti-correlated that I can make instruction sets, and that's the one-third result. But we, we are assuming that the universe is not intentionally screwing with the experiment every iteration of the So experiment. if I you know, assume that the even distribution, which was the, cor the correlation function, gave us zero, so the instruction sets, if, if I assume, if I have no way of figuring out, excuse me, figuring out which instruction set the universe prefers or chooses, then I would get a correlation of zero. So that in, you know. Because you're saying it's effectively random. It's effectively random. That which, you know, instruction they agree upon, that the particles agree upon at the center is random. But the quantum mechanics tells me no, it's anti correlated. And it's anti correlated in a way that's more so than what instruction sets could possibly do. Now, let me just uh, ask one more question iteration of this question mm -hmm. is there does this also count for the possibility where the universe knows that you're performing this experiment and knows that you're assuming that it's going to act randomly but it is intentionally skewing the result one way or another i believe that would fall into the realm of super determinism basically the idea that your in, in order to implement what you're talking about, the universe has to know what you're going to measure, mm -hmm. right? Or you, you say we're in a simulation. What you're going to measure is deter is determined by what the particles agree upon at the beginning, or or yeah, right. Uh, it, it would be it would be the idea that you, whenever you think you're choosing how to measure. Right. Whether when Alice and Bob choose, OK, I want to measure setting one, setting two or setting three, that instead of that being independent from each other, that instead there's the universe says, no, no, no. OK, Alice chose setting one this time. Then according to some rules that you know the humans don't know yet, Bob I will choose setting B. Right. The idea that I could measure and if if I knew from what Alice chose to measure, I could predict what Bob would choose to measure, you know, a hundred million light years away, potentially. Right. And that's, that's an idea called super determinism, which as far as we can tell in the universe, isn't, isn't true. Um, 
it appears that two independent people have the ability to have free will from each other. You don't necessarily have to have super free will. We could talk about the uh, determination of, you know, Alice choosing her measurement based on something she saw in the environment, based on how photons hit her, or based on what she had for breakfast, and the the setting, the sequence of settings she'll choose to measure mm -hmm. could be determined by that. But that even even if you say, oh, okay, this person doesn't have any free will, the, it's another statement to say the combination of these two people far apart from each other together don't have free will from each other, right? This this was uh, something that we talked about when we first talked about Bell's theorem a few episodes ago. It's it's the idea that even if I could, as long as, you know, Bob and Alice don't agree at the same time, like to communicate with each other what they're going to do. You know, they don't do their own instruction set problem. Right. Right. I could see, even if there is some event in terms of special relativity way back in the future, whose light cone could reach both Alice and Bob later on, that the correlation that it causes between them can actually be obscured away and doesn't matter. Okay, so you're, but you're still operating under the realm of a light cone. Yeah. I, I, I'm just tossing in this out from left field idea. Let's say that we're in a simulation mm -hmm. or there's just a higher entity that knows that we're trying to do this thing. Are, are we are we are we safe from that type of interference in in this type of experiment? No, because okay. it's it's uh, that's a philosophical question. Right? right. Right. It's it's is it's as hard to determine if that is true than to say, do humans have free will? Right. Okay. Right. Now, maybe we're pushing up right with with Bell's experiments. We're starting to figure out the the seams of the of the simulation you know the seams of reality to figure but out this is not the experiment to, to suss that out it's not the experiment to suss that specifically out uh as we talked it's the experiment that says you know you can't have three things together you can't have locality non-super determinism and outcome independence now one of those three things has to go away effectively because quantum mechanics is the thing that it is right uh, and the question is well how do we do that mm. nah. <laughs> There, there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics to try and get around that and try and deal with that. Copenhagen is one that just fails. Um, and so that might be an interesting topic to, uh, I think I'll bring up later, uh, not for this talk, but at another point of just the different ways of describing how do we end up with the, res the singular result that we have when, in fact, you know... Uh, I should classically expect not just singular results, uh, quantum results, but instead I should expect, you know, a, a gradient between all possible results that I could measure. But here, right, effectively, this correlation function uh, shows us that we can't use and shows us in the theory that we can't use instruction sets to account for the statistics that Merman's device or the, the statistics that you would find in a Bell experiment, right? Quantum mechanics, which we observe is uh, the true empirical result whenever we do measurements and such. Quantum mechanics can't be explained by particles agreeing beforehand how they will be measured, right? right. There's, there is, in fact, some spooky action at a distance when the when you know the measure alice measures the state and then bob measures his there is some correlation that is almost non that is non-local right is the usual interpretation and it, if we interpret this i mean a negative one half that's that's a pretty strong anti-correlation yeah yeah um it's i mean right remember for for this for the way for the results that are possible with the correlation right the maximum would be plus 1 and the minimum would be negative 1 so that's in fact pretty far along the way to negative 1 mm -hmm. all right and so we have to figure out well how do we account for this and that's merman's challenge how do i account instruction sets are out i don't know how to I, I can't have the universe i can't have the particles agreeing upon things how do i account for Fact one, that Alice and Bob will agree 100% of the time on what they measure when they happen to measure at the same setting, but they only agree a quarter of the time 
when they measure different settings. Right? Those are the two facts that we observe from the Mermis device. And it's, and or rather, you can also say, okay, how do we account for these two different these white on white just doesn't do well how do we account for these two different set of set of statistics instruction sets local hidden variables fail so we have to uh try something else okay so uh as i was saying the experiment that i just proposed that i just put together is in fact, the exact same type of experiment that Bell proposed when he was doing Bell's theorem. And we, in fact, just did the arguments of the Bell inequality and how this pops up. So let's see how we can construct this. Let's see how we can construct this for quantum mechanical systems, right? And in particular, right, Mermin's challenge is to explain the basic physics of quantum states and the conservation that drives this whole, the, the, the concept of this entanglement, right, to a general reader. So there's an important point that really forces Alice and Bob to agree, and that's that there's a conservation principle at the heart of this whole thing. There's a conservation of quantum angular momentum, quantum spin, as it's often called. Um, it's a quantity that particles have that adds together like like angular momentum does. Now, because of the way, you know, that we have to resolve particles, we can't say that it's the electron actually spinning. The electron isn't a ball. We, as actually pointed out last time with the uh, gyromagnetic ratio, right, we know that a electron doesn't follow a spherical distribution of charge and mass. So we can't say that it's just this ball spinning, but it does add as if it were, mm -hmm. which, yay, just makes understanding quantum mechanics even more difficult. <laughs> So let's go ahead and jump into the no, like the notion of how we would deal with the quantum mechanics. So uh, in this setup, right, an individual particle, um, we're going to resort to the bra and cat notation to relate what is the state of our quantum of our quantum mechanical systems, our particles being sent to Alice and Bob. So pretty straightforward. Um, this up represents a particle in the up state. And D will represent down state. Now again, I could, and let's just... And that would also be red plus one. Yeah. To be consistent with how I've characterized this, red plus one. Um, just a, a thing that is figuring out, oh, okay, this is that. If I look at the bra... for up or the bra for down, these are effectively asking how likely uh, am I going to find the particle that I hit it with? This is the mathematical tool that I would uh, hit it with to ask, okay, are you in the up state or the down state, right? Um, Mathematically, for quantum mechanics, this is how we construct the correlation function, right? Um, for example, uh, I could say, okay, how likely are you in the up state if you're in the up state? And the correlation function would be one. You're always in the up state if you're in the up state. Uh, if I ask, okay, are you in the ups? Are you in the down state if you're in the down state? Right? Again, one. But I could also have the opposite. I could ask, okay, are you in the upstate of a particle that's in the downstate? No, it's not. There's a zero cor there's zero correlation between upstate and downstate. Right. Same thing with same thing with downstates and upstates mixed together the opposite way. They are in fact zero. Um, <laughs> well, you know, so, uh, yeah. uh, now we also talked. Uh, uh, whenever we do quantum mechanics, right? Um, I've mentioned this before, but whenever you do quantum mechanics, you have operators, things that can be represented as matrices in the language of bras and cats, vector algebras, that represent different measurements that you make on the system. And for making spin measurements, 
the operators that I have are going to be called the poly spin matrices, right? So the first one right, would be sigma x. This is simply a 4 by 4 matrix that looks like that. I could... 2 by 2. Did I say 4 by 4? Yeah. Yeah, 2 by 2. Sorry. Since we have just up and down, we have two possible states, and I also have sigma z. So these are the matrices that I will hit my bra and cat with that will change, right, what vector it's, what state it's in, and then I will nussle it with a bra to ask, okay, after this measurement, are you in the up or are you in the down? And that's how I'll construct the quantum correlation function according to bras and cats, right? Uh, in this language, um, the up cat looks like one zero, and the down cat looks like zero, one. Okay. So these are the... Right, Why if I want to poly Y imaginary. So yeah, uh, an important point. Um, the I here is no longer the I that I used earlier with describing the co correlation function, which could be plus or minus one. This is instead the square root of negative one, because in quantum mechanics we deal with complex numbers, and hey, uh, I, the imaginary number, is in fact uh, the basis of how we construct a complex field. Uh, and really, there's there's squaring going on in all these. You're just, yeah. you're just dropping that from the notation yes. for convenience, right? Um, in order to in order to actually get a real probability field, right? We take the number, right, that we can the number that we get with a correlation function, and then we square it by what's called its complex conjugate. Basically, it's reflection in the complex field, and then we multiply those two things together. And conveniently, that's always guaranteed to give us a real number. And real numbers are the things that I know how to put on a measuring tape. Mm -hmm. And as uh, potentially we discussed before, you know, everything that I do, uh, yeah, we talked about this last episode, everything that I do can be boiled down to looking at, you know, a measurement on a ruler stick, right? Even measuring electricity or measuring where a ball is, all of that is saying, oh, here's a thing that I stick, and then it moves a dial onto a measuring stick. And from there I say, oh, you've got this much charge. Oh, you've got that much momentum. Right. Right. So if I want to make a measurement of a quantum object, say the up, uh, and I want to measure, okay, are you spin up or are you spin down? I hit it with the spin poly matrix for X, right? And the result that it gives me when I smash it together will make life, um, will actually you know, uh, change what we see. Uh, so, right, the... In result, for example, if I hit a up system with the asking, are you spin up or spin down? And this is this is all in the basis of spin up, spin down being in the oriented in the z axis. So when I say a particle is up, I'm saying it's oriented up in the z direction. Mm -hmm. Quantum mechanically, that's the most that I can specify when I'm specifying language. I can't specify, oh, you're up in the z direction and down in the y direction and uh, up in the x direction all at the same time. So whenever I... People are going to ask why. Uh, this we talked about for uh, an episode... Um, Effectively, quantum mechanics. Uh, so, so the technical answer is that the measurements of x, y, and z don't commute with each other, and because of that, you can't construct a basis that simultaneously gives you the measurement of all three of those. Um, for an actual answer, you go uh, if I empirically look at the data once I've measured something in the x direction, or I can even prepare the particle to be. In the x in the z direction, that doesn't give me any like, and I know I know that I select only actually yeah. So like okay, let's say you have a Stern Gerlach machine right, and I'm sending particles through it, and they're going to get ups and you're going to get downs. If I then on the path of the up particles, the ones that got sent up, 
put another stern girlack in the x direction or in the y direction you know, per the perpendicular direction the statistics that i'll get are going to be the same half of them will go to the left and half of them will go to the right and if I put, you know, that same stern girl like machine down at the bottom, half of them will go to the left and half of them will go to the right. The measurement that I made on the Z direction gives me no insight into the result that I could get for measuring in another perpendicular direction. So there's no correlation. Right. Saying. When I when I measure in one direction, if I measure your, my position in uh, one axis, then I can't say anything about how that will affect, right, the, jeez, oh, a, a number of things. I can't say how that will affect the momentum or position in another axis, for example, right? Because I can just measure, right, fundamentally one So basically, one thing if I start time. walking towards you, like what you're saying is, is we know as humans, the I'm walking towards you, so I'm mostly going to be moving along mm -hmm. this axis, but... Just because I'm moving along this axis doesn't mean I have to be not moving this way or this way or yeah. that way or that way. So, like, it classically, effectively, what you can do is I can make multiple measurements at once, right? I can look at you and pay, like, you know, keep taking pictures of you, measure your position, and at the same time hold up a speedometer on you and know your velocity and record both of those things at the same time. But in quantum mechanics, you can't do that. In quantum mechanics, the physical apparatus that you do to measure something always precludes measuring it in in directions or ways that are non-commutative with it. So, like I was saying, if, for example, right, I tried to take that two setup of stern girl X that I had before, where I was measuring in the Z direction first and then measuring in the X direction. If I tried to say, oh, well, let me do both of those measurements at once, smash together... Right. Instead of getting four dots, I would still get just get two dots where because of how I've done it, I would have, you know, the spin in the X plus X plus Z positive direction and the negative X plus Z direction. I would have a line that it would distinguish, not two lines being distinguished. Does that make sense? I might have described a little bit more than. Right. Because because yeah. you would be simultaneous because when you're when you ha go through the two steps, you're simultaneously asking, OK, are you spin up in Z and are you spin up in X? But I can't but I couldn't have the possibility. So effectively, what I've done is I've rotated the axis upon which I'm measuring. If I have two stereo X instead of measuring four. Right. Because before when I had them separated. Right, I would get four different results. I would have a splitting and then another splitting, hence four results. But if I combine those two measurements and try and do it at once, I'll just get two results. I don't actually recall the splitting part, but if the, spl the, the, the splitting where here's what I'm talking about. Okay, so where are the four results? So this is if you make one stern girl leg. Right. Right. If at this point here. I put another stern Gerlach machine and have another detector, mm -hmm. then I'll get two points. Let me put white on white. This is so smart, right? If I have uh, another stern Gerlach that gets just the top result, then I'll have, you know, left or right. And if I have a stern Gerlach that takes the bottom results, right, takes that that the trajectory here, then with magnets. Actually, let me use different color for the magnets. If I have my stern Gerlach magnets like this up here and some stern Gerlach magnets like this down here, right, then the beam coming into the up will be split into two possible results up here and the beam down here will also be split into two possible results. But the determination of you know knowing x or y doesn't have any effect on the proportionality of whether a particle on the bottom path goes left or right right and or whether a particle on the top goes left or right so i would have four results i would have four dots on these two but detectors. There'd, be, there'd be no up down information encoded right in those dots if then i took and did another layer from you know say this dot and put another uh z oriented stern girl like machine i would still get 
up and down from both of those particles, even though I had previously measured that it only that all these particles came from a measurement where they were all spin up. Mm -hmm. Once I've made an X measurement, I reset my wave function. I reset right. what the particle is into. And so I'll get an even distribution of up down yet again. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. So once you make a measurement in one direction, it erases all information you had of any other perpendicular measurement. Right. Um, and if I tried to say, bring these, you know, purple, um, magnets back so that I, or excuse me, pink. So I have both these magnets here and, you know, perpendicularly oriented magnets to the side. What I would get is not, what I would get is not the four dots that I saw for making two measurements, but instead two dots that are along an axis that, you know, is in line with what's created with the stern girl like that I have, right? If I have, let's say, for bad notation, let's say I have the stern gerlach orientation is plus minus up here. So, right, if, if I'm staring down the beam path here, so that's my beam, mm -hmm. right? Then spin up would go here, spin down would go here. And then I said, okay, well, let me also have an X measurement like this then you would get two results like that as opposed to the four results that we had if we made two different measurements and to be clear there wouldn't be like more up or more left no it's so uh, it, would, it would still be ambiguous yeah. as to how much it was up how much it was left it's ambiguous like how much the up result is attributable to the z versus the x right right it would just be completely split and note, we didn't even use the words observer effect or Heisenberg uncertainty principle. No, this is just this is just what you see when you make measurements. Now, arguably, you know, a uh, a measurement is an observer effect. But mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So, if I make a spin up or spin down measurement on um, on the up, okay, right, then. According to the math, the way that it works out, right? It'll just give me an up. If I make Z on, say, down, it'll give me back, it'll give me back minus the down. These are eigenvalues. And they give me the same, um, the same thing back, right? Uh, so now... What we have here with the Bell experiment setup is not single particles. So we have two particles, right? We have Alice's particle and we have Bob's particle. And the way that we're going to represent them is we want that to be one singular object. Now, normally, in order to really specify that, you would use something called a tensor space and you, or a tensor product between the vector spaces and come into what's called a Fox space. That is a combination of different Hilbert spaces. That's, that is the thing that describes the individual quantum mechanical systems. But enough of that word soup. Instead, what we are going to say is very simply because it's very easy to interpret this notation is that. For example, I could have up down and this is that Alice sees would mean Alice would see an up particle and Bob would see a down particle. That's it. Right. So first spot corresponds to Alice. Second spot corresponds to Bob. Right. And in this notation, for example, what I would have to do is simply use two spin matrices to represent the fact that both observer, right, Alice and Bob, both Alice and Bob are making measurements, right? So I would have something like if I were making, if they were making a measurement, say Alice measures X and Bob measures Z, right? Then on a, a state where, you know, Alice got an up in the Z direction particle and Bob got a down in the Z direction particle, then what we would end up with is you know, the negative down, down, right? So then when you're constructing your correlation functions, this is the cat that you would stick into that. Okay. And you already mapped out the truth table that shows that 
just a second ago, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, examples of it. Okay. To to write it out would be a long time. Yeah. Do you mind pulling down your polys just so they're still visible? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So basically, uh, this guy, right? This guy affects the first one, and this guy affects the second one. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you can see where the negative sign came from. Yeah. Yeah. Because the because the uh, Z on the D gives you a negative sign. Yep. Whereas the X just the X just shifts it from down to up, and the Y will give you a factor of I. Apparently, the X is in quantum computing. That's a not gate. Huh. What an interesting fact. I don't know much about quantum. But I've if seen a lot of comes in, out comes a zero, and vice versa. Ah, cool. Now. There's an important uh, fact when the fact when there's an important fact when the fact is <laughs> goodness. There's an important thing to consider when you have multiple particles. Specifically, as you we were saying, each of these particles has a spin associated with it. Right? I can treat it like a tiny little uh, bit of angular momentum. Now, when you have and and the fact that we are dealing with a system of two particles means we have to figure out. How do those two spins add? So there's two possibilities. I can either have them have their spin add together or fight each other. So I could construct a system where I have spin equal to zero or here what we'll use is we'll use electrons. And so these guys have spin one half and I could construct it so that their spins add together. If they add, they'll have a total spin of one. And the important point is that no matter what you do, what you measure, the fact is, is that you should have a, at the end of the day, a system that Alice and Bob together should have a system that has a spin of either one or zero, depending on how the particle, the entanglement is produced at the beginning. So how do we have that? Well, the first and the lowest energy possibility is to have it so that the spins fight each other, so that you have spin zero. This is called a singlet state. Why? Because there is a single one of them to create this, uh, this fact. So I will call it gamma or psi minus. Okay? And that is constructed by taking the two particle combination of up, down, minus two particle combination of down up and dividing it by a square root of two and the square root of two just says that each of these results is equally likely so what this is going to be represents is the indeterminism between whether alice gets the up particle or bob gets the up particle right in the first on the on the on the first one right up down Alice would measure a spin up particle and Bob would measure a down particle. And on the second term, you have down up, which means Alice would measure down and Bob would measure up. So when you create a spin zero system at your source, which you can ensure that it is spin zero before you send it out, there's we there's a ambiguity about which particle is which because you can't in quantum mechanics, you the math that we have, right? explicitly uh, identifies which particle is which, right? If I use a single ket, I know that, oh, okay, Alice is getting the up and Bob is getting the down. But whenever you are sending off two electrons, there's no way of distinguishing, right, which one is which until you look and measure, right? Which one has the spin up or which one has the spin down. So Which would collapse. Right, which collapses your wave function, uh, which, which it counts for making an actual measurement. But as far as before you make a measurement on the object, right? Any electron that you get is the same as any other electron that you get. It's only when you measure it and then compare your results to the other person who measured their entangled particle that you realize, oh, there was in fact a correlation between these two objects, right? Mm -hmm. And so the the, the way to shoehorn in this indistinguishability between between particles of the same type is this way of of adding adding or subtracting uh, bras and cats that represent, you know, the same thing, but with them swapped. Right. Okay. All right. So you're saying the notation on the very top, the numerator mm-hmm. is specifically because we can't really distinguish between Alice and Bob's electron. Right. Un- until we've actually made the measurement. Until they make the measurement. They can't. Even though we've, we've created their entanglement. 
-hmm. we still can't say, hey, you send the spin up one out this way and you spin spin up or spin down the other This is a way to guarantee that Alice and Bob will receive entangled particles that when they measure one, when they measure their particle and get the result, we know that the other, uh, the other experiment or the other observer will get the opposite result. This is the spin zero set. There's three other ways to uh, combine the up down. And what they give you is these are the three ways in which you can have spin one states. And there's a triplet. So this is the triplet. And each of these, it's, it's called a triplet uh, because each of these has the same energy, right? The singlet state has a different energy than one of the triplet states. And each of these right, corresponds to having the same energy and having the same spin, which is spin one, because you have two one halves adding together. Whereas before with the singlet state, state, we had two one halves subtracting from each other. Right? So the possible orientations are having again up down but this time their kets adding together you have up up with or and down down um, with a subtraction between them and you have up up plus the down down state and again all of these are given a factor of square root two and this ensures that each uh, of the you know of the two terms in each of these different states, uh, each is equally likely to be observed by Alice or Bob. Okay, so explain to me again how you went from saying a singlet state has one third the energy of a triplet. No, 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 not 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 one third. A singlet state has less energy than one of the triplet states, and one of the tri- any one of the triplet states has the same level of energy as any other in the triplet state uh, basically because the energy in your system is can is, you show me what you mean by a triplet state like uh what what would be the actual configuration of spins in a triplet state versus it is it is a configuration that that the um spins the up down orient the up down kets uh are added together in such a way that they have a total of spin one because your energy right well, they're both one half right so each particle has one half spin. Right. But when I add to get when I'm trying to do a system with two particles, I have to figure out how does the angular momentum of two one half particles add. Literally, if I've got a arrow, one arrow that I can put either up or down, and I've got another arrow that I can put either up or down, how can I add these two arrows? Right? Let me put an or in here, right? How can I add these two? What what are the possible configurations that I can add these arrows? I can add them in one way, where uh, effectively by to to keep the identity indistinguishable. There's one way I can add them so that they cancel out, and three ways that I can add them such that they equal one. So as they add together um, positively instead of fighting against each other. Okay, but you, you keep going back and forth between one, one half, and up, down. So like, where are you actually getting the word one from? Like, where's the value one coming so from? So I can add, I can add two one halves. Right. Right. I can, I can have them oriented so that one is up and one is down. So I can have one half minus one half, and that gives me zero. Or well, I can hold have... Hold on, hold on. So one half minus one half is... One particle is up and the other one is down. That would be, yes, that would be the state. Okay. And then if you wanted spin one, then they would both be in the up. No, in fact. Hence, this, it's not quite as simple as that. Because I can have okay. the particles be up and down, but add their cats in such a way that total their spin is still one. Um, this is just, there's a whole there's a whole little sheet called Klepsch-Gordon uh, tables. It's it's the way that... So this has already been mapped out ahead of time. Absolutely. Like, I'm fine with that. You don't yeah, have yeah. to show me how it is. Yeah, but... yeah. Like, I, I will not. I will not yeah. touch a, I will not touch a, the Klepsch-Gordon tablet again. Never again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. 
Dr. Woods made us do that once, and that was enough for me. Effectively, uh, angular momentum adds weird. Okay. So uh, it's there possible it's possible to have things that are quantum mechanically here, you know, look like they should add to zero. But in fact, because of how I add the cats, they end up being one. Okay. Right? And that's that's this special guy here, right? He's oriented so that Bob and Alice will measure, you know, up and down opposite. But the system still has a total spin of one because of the difference between this plus here and that minus there. Okay, so which one is a spin one state here? Is that the singlet or the triplet? The triplet is spin one. Okay, triplet is spin one. You can tell that because we've got, easily because we've got these guys, right? This includes the two, the two kets where both of the particles are in the same orientation. The natural way that I would say, oh, okay, this is a spin one state, right? Both are up or both are down, right? Okay. Because you can have, because here, here we're talking about the magnitude, right? I could have, you know, this is this is a choice between a, well, both of these are a choice between a spin state where it's plus one or minus one, right? Um, but because of the weirdness of the math of angular, angular addition, yeah. right? Angular momentum addition, uh, this also is a spin one half system, or a spin one system when you combine them this way. Okay, so the triplet is spin one, and singlet is... Uh, s singlet is spin zero. Right, this is total angular momentum, not just spin. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, now, because here is... You might want to put spin zero and spin one, like, next to them. Yeah. S equals zero, and S equals... One. Okay. And those are the three possible triplet states. Right. Okay. And so so your Hamiltonian, right, as she's correct in pointing out, this is total spin. But your your angular moment your angular momentum determines the energy that is in your system, right? You have the energy that's based off of spin. You could have it based off of particular momentum, but here we don't even have a momentum that we're caring about. So the thing that's going to to split up your energy levels is what is the angular spin, the angular momentum of you know your quantum mechanical state. You can have spin be zero, and so there's one way to create that, hence singlet. And you can have spin be one, and those are all energetically indistinguishable from each other. And there are three ways to do that, so we call it a triplet state. That is got it. Notation, hooray. Okay. Right now. The thing that we have to kind of take into account here um, is the options that Alice and Bob have to or orient their Stern Girl like application, right? Because there's some physical, right? If I look at this example of the Stern Girl like again, there is basically a length right that i'm choosing to orient the stern girl like and then a rotation around that so one of the very first things that i have to make sure is that right the the question of entanglement is about the rotation but we also have to make sure that depending on how we are preparing our particles that i measure my spin in the correct way right uh effectively when i have angular momentum states like this um i have to make sure that i respect the symmetry that these objects are creating in uh in 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 the group in the space of rotations that i could make so what is that going to represent well effectively what i could think about is that in the space of rotations, the singlet state, right? The singlet state represents a dot, right? A dot at the origin of a dot at the origin of X, Y, and Z. And no matter how I choose to measure that dot, no matter what ray I choose to measure that dot along in this space, it will always look like a dot, 
it will always look like the same thing. So this is what is called SO3, Special Orthonormal Group 3 for three dimensions, invariant, right? Because when we're doing quantum mechanics, oftentimes what is the most natural language is to talk about the symmetries that you see in the particular group that represents uh, the, the, the transformations that you can perform upon it. And one of, why is my computer sleeping? Uh, one of the things I could do is I could just do a rotation, any arbitrary rotation in three-dimensional space trying to measure what this thing is. And if I'm doing a singlet state, no matter how I choose to measure it, I will always get the, the symmetry that that dot represents. Because, right, a dot, no matter how I look at it, a dot will always look the same. Now, you mean you'll you'll have a dot along the axis that you're measuring or you always have a dot centered at the origin? Indistinguishable because in this abstract mathematical picture, we're always measuring, right? Because oh, I'm trying to, and maybe I'm doing the wrong thing here. I'm trying to apply to where you had the, uh, the picture of what the pattern would look like if it was classical or was filled in mm -hmm. or if it was, um, quantum where it's just going to be the up the top or the bottom effectively what this is saying is that right the arrow that i'm i'm drawing here represents the arrow that represents the length that i set my stern gear like machine so right. if i have my source on the stern gear like machine say send up here and so i orient my stern gear like magnets here Right. And then make my choice of, you know, alpha or beta, depending on who's making the measurement. The if I have a singlet, if I have a singlet particle. The correlations that I expect, right, will be the same, regardless of whether I choose this line or that line to measure along. OK, so you're basically saying no matter which direction I emit. When I orient my stern Gerlach to be able to accept it along the long axis i'm mm -hmm. always still going to just get a point yeah result i i, I will get the 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 i'm not going to get a spread out pattern well here yeah uh because you'll, you'll get a non-spread out pattern regardless it's uh, kind of an abstract argument in the math itself to make sure that we're respecting the symmetry of the spin object that we're measuring for a singlet it looks like a point but for example if i measure one of the triplet states effectively in in so3 what this will look like is not a dot but let's say you know we've got the triplet states not a dot but a particular arrow in that space uh the and in fact so the symmetries that the triplet states represent are going to be the symmetry for a measurement in the x y plane Let's use different colors. Move this here. So this is the XY plane of symmetry. This is a arrow in the Z direction. So that no matter how I measure it in the XY direction, right? No matter how I orient my stringer, like the, the rotational uh, orientation, as long as it's in the XY plane, then there's a then it's it's symmetric right the arrow along the z-axis looks the same no matter what how i rotate around x and y okay right so if i stare down z so that the things that i can see in my space is x and y no matter how i rotate this that arrow will look the same right right that object will look the same and it's going to be true for the other two objects as well if i look at the um phi minus Right. This is when I'm looking at Y, Z okay. symmetry. So basically an arrow pointing in the X direction. And if I'm looking at phi plus, then this is going to be X, Z. An arrow in the Y direction. Okay. Right. Now, uh, this is important. So what looks like a dot? What looks like an arrow? Or what, what is it that you're saying when you're saying it looks like a dot? 
are you saying that I'm actually looking, if, if I'm imagining the space in my mind, I'm actually looking at this little ray with a little cone at the end. It's actually pointing. Now, if I'm in singlet, I'm literally staring down that ray at all times. So that's why I'm only seeing a dot. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm in the, any of these three triplet states, then I'm going to see, assuming I'm following these three planes that you've set up, I'm, I'm looking along those three planes, I'm always going to see right. the, two of those little arrows, right. not staring down yeah. one of the arrows. So, so okay. it, it represents the way that I've effectively set up my stern gerlach when when i have a spin one the thing that you will say oh okay if i set up my spin gerlach so that it's measuring along the z-axis then the object that you're going to be considering is going to be the one for, for spin one is going to be phi plus right because that's the one that has the right symmetry in that group now it, we need to be able to deal with all three and show that the show that the symmetry is respected for each one in the appropriate plane uh, because they will look like, you know, arrows in this abstract space. Mm -hmm. So you want your experiment to reflect that. And we'll, we'll get to that in a sec. Okay. Okay. Specifically, so, and, and this, this again is how, not necessarily how we deal with things physically, but how the theory itself is able to predict or tell us what we should see in the results of our experiment, right? Uh, and you know, sometimes it ends up as something as abstract as the path of eight ways, which is that you can show the identities in uh, of the particles in your um, standard theory, right, from quantum field theory, that it follows a group that has an eightfold symmetry. And from that, you can predict the quantum properties of the particles that are in the standard model. Does Did it you enjoy putting that sentence together? Oh my goodness, it was hard. Does that <laughs> correlate to something that I can directly measure? Right, the math straight to the empiric result? Uh, technically, but there's a few steps in between that often when you're like dealing with the theory versus doing the experiment, you know, you don't actually go through. Makes okay. sense. When I when I'm working with theory, I stay in this land. When I'm working with experiment, I stay in this land. And it's only when the theorist goes, well, maybe I have any results to test it out. Let's figure out what it would look like in experiment that you try and bridge the two. And, oh boy, <laughs> sometimes it's hard. This is why theory work, uh, particularly the quest to find things like quantum gravity, et cetera, is very difficult because the appropriate mathematical object might not directly translate into physical things that I can think about being like physically touching oh, like, or holding. like M theory. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So next we should talk about how to describe in this language. The block sphere. Is that what it's called? The visualization? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's this B-L-O-C-H. Yep. It's this whole little thing, which uh, is another, is, is fundamental to another topic that one day I'll bring up and start yelling at sure. you about. It'll be great. Now, how in this language do I describe... Alice and Bob making arbitrary measurements. Well, let's look at it. So we'll say that Alice makes measurement one, sigma one. And so she orients her device in what we saw before was the A direction and measures along that one of the, well, a, a combination of the poly matrices uh, corresponding to that, right? So effectively what that looks like is A hat, dotted with a um, a what we call a spin vector, a poly vector. So effectively what that is, is the vector A in the yeah, A in the X direction, the component of A in the Y direction, the component of A in the Z direction, dot producted, dot, yeah, taking the dot product between that and the spin poly matrix measurement in the X direction, the spin poly matrix measurement in the Z direction, and the spin poly measurement in the, oh, excuse me, Y direction, but the last two flipped, the way I've drawn it as opposed to this. Now, the way that dot products met, so uh, an important point, these things, this vector has a magnitude of one. So I make sure that I pick these so that it's just a direction as opposed to a... It's normalized. Uh, yeah, yeah. A, a vector itself. So there are two ways you can resolve this. This is going to be, you know, the X component times the 
X spin. So this tells me how much of Al what Alice has chosen, the direction Alice has chosen to measure and how much of that is in the X direction, how much of that is measuring a spin with a spin girl like that separates along the X direction, how much is Alice measuring in the Y direction, and how much is Alice measuring in the Z direction. Wow, those look incredibly similar. Let me make that a little bit better. Right? Now, there's another way that we can resolve dot products between two, two, um, what's it, two vectors, and this will be important later, is that I also know that the number that I'll get out from this is equal to the magnitude of one of those guys times the magnitude of the other, which I represent mathematically as these little bars here, and... Goes up. The cosine of the angle between them, right? So if I were to have some uh, vector one here and another vector two here, what I could say is okay, how much of vector one is in the direction of vector two? And that's effectively what the dot product is telling me. Now, if I know the magnitude of them, right, um, and this, how much, uh, this, what is the projection of V1 onto V2, or actually, there's a better way to denote this, which I will call the projection onto V2 of V1, right? One particular vector. And that's going to be directly related to the cosine of the angle between V1 and V2, right? The only thing that matters for the dot product is a relative measurement between the two vectors we're interested in, okay? Same thing for Bob. Bob will measure what we'll call sigma 2, which is just his little B hat, the orientation of the Stern Gerlach machine that he's made, dotted again with not sigma, but the sigma, the poly matrix measuring vector, which will give us a similar thing. It'll be BX plus sigma X, BY plus sigma Y plus B, Z, sigma, Z. So, now we can go ahead and finally, finally, put together the thing that I've been hyping up this entire time, the correlation function, right? Something that keeps nagging me. Did you mean to put sigma, Z in the... And the dot product over there? Nope. <laughs> I did not. Okay. It's just like, no, there's a little doohickey that should be attached to that. I should definitely write a thing. It's like, no, Z was the last thing you wrote, so just do that. Right. Okay. You know, you know how brains are. <laughs> it's just like, oh, let me just repeat the pattern that I did. Okay. So, once we have, because what, we what we're interested in, is the correlation functions uh, constructed between the different spin triplet states that we have, right? So, uh, for example, the correlation function for the singlet state, phi minus, when Alice and Bob make their spin one, their, their spin measurements, is going to be this object. And what that ends up being is when I, because I know that this on, you know, an up down will give me either an up or a down. And then the, and these are constructed of up downs in the way that we oriented before. When I go through the calculation, I will get nothing about, you know, the spin poly matrices left, but instead things that are in terms of the coefficients that they decided to measure by. Move that down just a little bit. Uh, 
So what I'll get for the singlet state is minus a bx and ax minus by minus a z bz. What I'll get for the for the different spin one states, let's say plus sigma one, sigma two, psi plus is going to be ax bx plus ay by minus az bz. If I have phi minus and the correlation of the measurements between phi minus is going to be minus ax bx plus ay by plus az bz and phi plus sigma one sigma two plus is going to give me ax bx minus ay by plus az bz okay so here's an interesting point right what i noted was the dot product corresponds to theta right, corresponds to a cosine on theta. And if I have just a dot product between, say, like I said here, Vx, right, actually I wrote it out here, right, I could write, you know, components of one vector and another vector where the indices are matching. Or I could say, oh, that corresponds to a cosine measurement. Well, if I look at that, and compare it to down here with the correlation functions, what I notice is this is minus cosine the angle between, you know, A and B with regards to all possible directions. If I ignore for each of these, not ignore the components that are that have the minus signs, that have signs that are different. But I'll see, this is cosine the angle between A and B in the, well, let's put it like this, in the x, y for this guy. Cosine. Oh, there's your three planes. The angle between this for the uh, for the y, z, and cosine, the angle between a and b, as long as I limit myself to the x, z planes. So if I lift it up, limit, <laughs> right? So what I'm doing, well, the correlation function, basically, right, if I'm measuring along, say, so that my Stern-Gerlach is rotated in the XY plane, the thing that I'm going to be measuring, if I know I have a spin one system, is this guy. If I have it oriented so that I know I'm measuring in the YZ plane and spin one, it's going to be that guy. And finally, for XZ, if it's spin one, it's this guy. Or if I know I have a spin zero system, the thing that my Stern-Gerlach will be measuring is this. Now, so when I limit myself to that, what was the assumption that let you drop the, um, like the A's, A Z B Z? Uh, the knowledge that when you are measuring uh, your your system of the spin one system of the Stern Gerlach, that the rotation, the thing that you're going to see, the thing that keeps you symmetric with regards to that that orientation of the Stern Gerlach, so the the state that the particle coming through that has to be in to respect that symmetry, mm -hmm. right, is the one of these three of the triplet state that matches the orientation of the Stern. Okay. Track, right. Um, so what that means is for each of these correlations, the only thing that matters between them 
is the relative angle between how Alice measures and how Bob measures. There's no other indication or reliance upon whether you're an X, Y, or Z, whether, you know, there's some true orientation or even for the fact of how I have set up my particles. Because here, what we assume with what we assumed with this, with the language that I described before, is that the source entangles your particles in the Z direction. But the correlation functions have no specific reliance upon the, the Z direction. The only thing that will matter to them is the angle between what Alice measures and what Bob measures. So that's where you get your rel relative uh, right. observer. So from here, we're going to... It's just, it's just the correlation between the two angles mm -hmm. that they so, measured. If I take right now that I've now that I've said, oh, okay, effectively the correlation function for the Stern Gerlach machine is here since the uh, measurements by both A and B are are uh, unit vectors, so they have a magnitude of one. So then when I use, you know, this version of figuring out what the dot product is, these are both equal to one, so it's just cosine. What I can say is that oh okay the correlation function is just cosine of the cosine of the separation between them and so i can say okay what does that translate to for our merman device well case a that would be cosine of 0 which is 1 and in case b that's cosine and if they're always opposite right it'll either be plus 120 degrees or minus 120 degrees Cosine symmetric, so I may as well just say what's the cosine of 120 degrees. Well, I just want another line to write, which is the same as cosine of negative 120 degrees, which is negative one half. Matching the results, so quantum mechanics, the correlation function matches the Merman device and not the statistics of the instruction set. So what does this mean? Well, the Merman device represents either two things. One, a spin one entangled particle pair for when Alice and Bob both agree, like if Alice sees red and Bob sees red, that's a spin one system. They both agree on the measurement. If instead I, I allow the, the, the opposite correlation that whenever Alice sees red, Bob should see green in the case one, right, when they met, when they have the same orientation, well, that represents a spin zero entangled particle system. So Merman's device, the statistics that we see, exactly reproduce, are exactly the results of whenever I try to take data on a quantum mechanical system. Okay. Yeah. So either way, we get an anti-correlation for case B Instead of no correlation or the minimum correlation that instruction sets would indicate that we should in fact get. I mean, it's it's right there. <laughs> I mean, you've just kind of spelled it out. It's kind of like yeah, it's not even profound anymore. It's like well, okay, yeah, yeah. So well, here there it is. We find ourselves with a a simple analogy with what we found in modern physics with special relativity. Whereas in special relativity, Alice and Bob making measurements. Uh, to a source, even though they have different velocities relative to a light source, the Lorentz transform ensures that the agreements between measurements will only depend upon their relative velocities. Mm -hmm. When Alice and Bob have different stern gerlach orientations, different reference frames, right, as far as what they can probe reality with, the resulting correlation functions depend only on the relative stern gerlach orientations. Now, this is an important contrast here because while we are able to... Um, here, it's, it's an important point because we are able to only get measurements of plus or minus h-bar in these experiments, right? I get a result of either red or green, plus or minus. But I know that I, my system should conserve spin angular momentum, right? I, the, one of the fundamental 
pieces that I have in physics is that ang- is that angular momentum and momentum in general, right? Whenever I do physics on it, without an outside influence, right? The sum, the change in that should be zero. And by measuring what orientation you're in, you aren't you aren't changing the angular momentum, so they should measure a conservation uh, that 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 you know that up and down or up up depending on whether you choose spin one spin zero that those agree the right way but when you have only plus or minus you can't do that on a trial by trial result so so how can we possibly go about this well one of the so what you're saying is is we need to go from this discreteness that we're in to actually being able to measure we need to be able H-bar. to describe how can a discrete set of information, discrete set of plus or minus, regardless of how you're oriented, how can that reproduce the conservation of angular momentum that we know is true? Um, well, where has it violated it? Has it violated it? Mm-hmm. Uh, we will get there in a sec. So, okay. Because one of the important things, right, is the quantum mechanically we know in our results we can get plus or we can get minus. Um, and yeah, so in fact, yeah, let's jump in my notes. And in fact, uh, cause it's right. If I have, if I, well, actually, you know, just even explain this, right? If I have a particle, and let's just say that we happen to have the fact that Alice has a spin up, and that means Bob gets a spin down for mm-hmm. spin zero, right? right? But what if Bob measures along this axis, right? Alice will say, oh, okay, I've got spin in the plus one in the X or in the Z direction, which should be consistent here. Bob will get a result. Here, he'll get a result of spin down, right? Because, well, this is this is the particle that he gets, and it's oriented this way. Bob tells you, oh, okay, it's spin, because of the way this is oriented, um, let's say it's at 45, so it's plus, uh, minus 1, Minus one in the, I got to get it. Yeah, minus one square root two in the z direction and minus one square root two in the x direction. And so when I try and combine. So Alice measured in the z axis. Alice measured z axis, right. got a plus one result. Bob measured in a. 45 degree angle axis. And when I combine these two to try and get what is the spin total of uh, the spin total value of the system, right? They come back and say, oh, I measured this, I measured that. What they'll find is that the spin for this trial does not equal zero, Mm. even though they were given a spin zero particle. Okay. Okay. The fact that Bob is depending on, is limited to a plus or minus result, regardless of how he orients his Stern Gerlach machines, means that on a trial by trial basis, you don't get the same result, or you, not the same result. Of course, do I do you get the same result? Or not? It depends. You don't get a conservation of angular momentum. Okay. Okay. Because here, right, uh, or even better, right? Let's say Alice, Bob get this par- particle pair. Alice decides to measure the blue, and she sees it spin up. Bob measures pink he measures left right bob will get a result and you know x and y whenever whenever i try and find let's say he gets the result that it's spin to the left these don't directly cancel each other whenever i try and add them up right i have to use pythagoreans uh the right the triangle rule in order to figure out the relative size of vectors and so this this doesn't cancel out this is spin not equal to zero on that one trial even though the particle that Bob received was this one, which did in fact have spin zero if he measured it in the right direction. So this is a, I 
dichotomy, a contradiction, a point of friction between case A and case B. In case A, when they happen to measure along the same axis, they always agree because the particles that they get are directly entangled such that they do match the statistics that you have. If for spin zero, which uh, let's just say for, for the rest of the time, that we'll have a spin zero, that they do in fact cancel out, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's when there is a difference in how they measure because Bob is forced to, even though you know he's not measuring say the true entanglement orientation of the particles, he's still measuring a plus or minus one result, right? right. Now, why is that? Well, you can reformulate quantum mechanics um, into kind of an information theory. Well, what way. happens when you do it over a period of time and then you sum all those results together? So, I mean, we know that that is, in fact, a possibility. We'll get there. Okay. Because uh, we... Did I just break my computer? So, we can reformulate... I think I did. Oof. Here's my notes. This stupid thing. Billy's saying that's similar to what? Similar to light intensity through a pair of rotated polarizers. Oh, interesting. So what I can what you can do, right, is there there's a number of ways to formulate quantum mechanics. Uh Dayak, uh, or excuse me, Dayak and Birkner have uh, a particular way, and you can reformulate quantum mechanics in three ways as kind of a, a probability theory by assuming three things. First, the amount of information capacity, that an elementary system that you have has the information carrying capacity of at most one bit's worth of data, and all systems with the same information carrying capacity are equivalent. This is, are you giving me a big list of stuff? You yeah, might, a bit. Might want to write it down. Three things. Oh, okay. So you can do the the important one. So so Dakic and Bruckner. Right. Fine. Uh, Q M. Axiom one. That we have. Oh, meeting got rescheduled. Hell yeah. Information capacity. Elementary systems have at most one bit, up or down, left or right, that uh, I have locality, that the state of the composite system is completely determined by local measurements on substance and the correlation, right? And I can redo quantum mechanics if I have, lastly, reverse ability. That is, between any two pure quantum mechanical states, there exists a reversible transformation. This is a way of doing um, some quantum probability, but it's in axiom one that we really find the heart because our stern like is an elementary system. Right? We have two, a setup, or rather, each system that Alice and Bob have, right, their individual stern Gerlach is an elementary system. So at most one bit's worth of information is available to them per measurement that they make, right? No preferred referencing says that the up or down results are as good as possible and eats up the information that the system could possibly give you for either Alice or Bob if, with a single measurement. So how do we respect conservation of angular momentum well because the correlation function remember what we described uh, earlier about the correlation function we oh wow we've gone quite far down right the mm -hmm. correlation function involved a summation over all the events and the correlation function is what's telling me that i've got this you know cosine factor the thing that respects the angular momentum I could have the um, result, I could have the respecting of conservation of angular momentum, not on the trial by trial maybe, but instead over the average, just kind of like what you were asking about, Right. over the course of a bunch of experiments. So let's look at how that would look. Because I already know that you can encode partial information in a series of bits. Exactly. I mean, that's, a, that's the basis of arithmetic coding. Yep. 
It's that it's on the conservation uh, or on, on the average level that forces us to, um, you know, instead of on the individual trial by trial basis. Yep. So uh, if we look at, you know, the the construction of the data set, right? If I look at case B where the orientations are going to be off by some amount, right? Let's say that they're, that Alice and Bob have in events. So they are sent in particles or in events for them to measure, mm -hmm. right? So what would the correlation function for that be? Well, the correlation function, right, Alice and Bob measuring their particular angles would be something that looks kind of like this, that Alice measures plus one, and maybe in this one, Bob measures minus one, and then there's an event where Alice, for whatever she, her, her, her setup out measures plus one, and Bob happens to measure plus one, et cetera. And then you divide by your in total results, right? Well, because this is a, a, uh, a summation, right? Just like how we talked about partition functions or anything, summing is commutative. So I can group my results as long as I don't overcount or anything. I could, for example, group this and say, okay, let's say, let's look at all of the measurements that include a factor of Alice measuring plus one. And we'll call the the group grouping of all of Bob's measurements that match this just some B A plus, and then all of the the remaining results, which must be that Alice measured negative one, and that is the sum of Bob's results given that Alice measures negative one, right negative, and then that's going to end up being divided by n. The only thing that I can talk about a way of dealing with this in average by saying, okay, this has to equal just one half plus one A, an average of Bob's results given that Alice measures plus, which I'll denote by this little bar here, and one half minus one for Alice's results, and the average of Alice getting minus one. And the only thing here that I've assumed is that Alice will measure one half pluses and one half minuses over a large, uh, consistently over a large enough number of samples, right? No matter how she orients her Stern Gerlach, she will on she will measure plus and minus with equal frequency, mm -hmm. right? So let's look at this. Right, the the key to understanding this then is what are the values that I could have for these averages, right? If, if I have a spin zero system, right? Alice is given a particle that has this spin. And if it's spin zero, then Bob is going to have a complementary particle, right? Spin B in that direction. And let's say that Bob decides to measure along this axis. Well, then what Bob should see is the projection, uh, yeah, the projection of his arrow, right, his spin particle along the direction he's chosen to measure. So he should see the projection along B of his particle, SB, right? But, and, and the result of this would be, right, cosine theta. But he's only allowed to have values between plus and minus, right, h-bar, h-bar over 2, as we showed earlier. But quantum mechanically... Not he, quite. Hmm? Did we show that? Uh, yeah, last time at the end for how... Oh. You, how, how okay. Right. Uh, it's the fact that your spin matrices, not the poly matrices, but the one that represent actual like units of spin, include a factor of h bar divided by two. Okay. That's all. Um, yeah, that's all. So if 
right? Just kind of like that picture I was talking about earlier. You can, like you in fact pointed out beautifully, is that you can encode the results. This doesn't tell me. Spin zero. Good, good, good. You can encode the results, the average results over many trials. So, for example, technical difficulties are always fun. <laughs> what are you trying to do? Get this picture in here so that it's not garbage. Oh. Okay. So, here, the arrow on the left will be is is what uh, is looking at what Alice measured right so Alice is given a particle measures a spin up particle right in whatever basis that she chooses and we'll say that it, she's consistent across all possibilities now as Bob measures along this second arrow right, this is Bob and this arrow is Alice did you seriously just write Alice in black? Yeah, I did. <laughs> the irony is a camera can see it better than I can. No. Uh, let's instead do colors. You got a good point. Or I guess I can do Alice in black. So we have Alice's measurement. I'm not going to lie. Doing, doing these dots, drawing in different colors on the black background. Even in like blue and green is just like so hard to see just because of all the dots and it comes out so much better on camera. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Right. So Alice always measures this uh, yellow dot here and this arrow represents Bob's stern girl like orientation. So as we move in this direction, right, move across this picture right to the right, then, you know, this represents Bob measuring an angle between his uh, stern girl like analysis of whatever, you know, the angle it shows. And this yellow dot will be the average of all of his results across a large number of trials. Okay. And it's across this average that I'm able to say, oh, okay, it's possible, like you were saying, to say that, you know, the average that Bob measures for Alice's plus results would be for a spin zero particle cosine the angle that he the relative angle between his and Alice's measurements and it's definitely possible to construct that the average of Bob's for the minus results would be regular cosine not minus but just regular cosine and if I stick that into this function this correlation function that I had up here right what that will look like is that, okay, the correlation function then becomes alpha beta equals one half plus one negative cosine theta plus one half negative one cosine theta. And what do we find? Oh, hey, look, the correlation function gives me I can actually write cosine is gives me ah exactly the correlation function for a spin zero particle. So by so by saying okay the average result which is fine to construct the average result out of multiple trials that are you know binary effectively, I can still construct this partial for this partial um, this partial result this partial uh, value between one and negative one, even though on an individual level, I am forced to be plus or minus one. But this is exactly what we have for, um, this is exactly the result that we would have in the quantum mechanical spin singlet state, that the average conserved to the cosine theta gives us the proper correlation function that we see when measuring quantum mechanical systems. So, just as easily, uh, Bob could partition his data so that he looks at Alice's data based on whether he got pluses or whether he got minuses. And according to that reference frame, that partitioning of 
plus or minuses of Alice's data corresponding to his and claim that it's Alice who must average her results to get the correct correlation function. Right? They, the way that you group, right, whether you group all of Alice's plus and minus results together, or, excuse me, the way, whether you group all of Bob's results according to whether Alice got a plus one or a minus one, or whether you group together all of Alice's results when Bob got a plus one or a minus one. Those two different pictures say that, oh, I got plus or minus one. You, the other observer, need to average your results to correctly predict the statistics that we see. And so each of them can, says that the other has to do that. Okay. Right? So, so in any every situation, it's always going to be both people are going to say to the other person, you need to average your results. Mm -hmm. So just in the same way that when you have... Does that mean a single result is no longer useful? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that a single result is no longer useful. It's when you are trying to look at the correlations, the, the spooky action at a distance. So if I am looking at locally my results and what's happening to my system and not trying to consider any outside influence, then... All I have to do is then then not worrying about averaging and looking at the results of my particular uh, experiment is fine. It's when you're trying to account for outside influences, right? The entanglement, the fact that Alice measuring something in a particular way, measuring up, forces your system to measure down. Now, because of no signaling theorems, right? the information, the speed of the information that could go from Alice's system to yours, to affecting yours, uh, is not faster than the speed of light, right? You can't know that Alice is affecting your system until you do your, ex do your experiment and then confer with Alice later. Right. Right. The, if, if I had to, to worry about, you know, to invalidate my results on a singular level, would require that the information that Alice could give me by measuring a single, uh, measuring her system, could reach me superluminally, basically. So you're saying it doesn't invalidate a single result as long as Alice couldn't have affected you or isn't in your light cone, basically. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The moment you get to light cone, you start to have to deal with, like, uh, what does that count as affecting it or not? But, like, you know, if, if I have... Jeez. If I have an entangled particle that is at the heart of my Schrodinger's cat, you know, two Schrodinger cat experiment, right? Whether Alice's cat lives or dies right messing with my cat my individual results of oh this cat is alive or this cat is dead will be true regardless of what happens you know over analysis statement i, I couldn't i won't measure ever measure half of a dead cat right a cat that's half dead and half alive right even though alice would say no 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 you to conserve things you you should see half a dead cat and half a live cat you go, no, 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 my individual results are, you know, I measured this cat's box and it was alive, and I measured this cat's box and it was dead, right? I'm okay, so it's conserved in Bob's experiment, yeah. because he did one experiment, and he clearly has the two conserved. So across, they, so if I had across multiple, them. if I had multiple Schrodinger's cats, <laughs> right, multiple boxes with poor kitties stuck inside, then, you know, Bob would, you know, see a live cat or a dead cat, but on the, at, on the whole you could predict the percentage of which cats would be alive or dead based on looking at Alice's results, right? Even though... Right, and we're, we're dealing with entangled particles. Right, even though you triggers, might not necessarily yeah. be able to predict um, whether, whether a... So if you look at a single pair of boxes between Alice and Bob, if, you know, the poison is released based on whether you get an up or a down depending on your stern girl like orientation, if Alice and Bob do perpendicular results, I wouldn't be able to tell from Alice's result what Bob's result for that particular experiment is. But across the whole, 
mm-hmm. if they're if all of those particles are entangled the same way, I could. And by the same way, you mean using the same apparatus? Yeah, yeah. Not not all the spin downs go this way and spin up. Right, through. right. The, the, the correct type of entanglement. Okay. Basically, as long as I'm not jumping between, you know, uh, spin one and spin zero or whatever. Right. And the way that I could see this uh, temporally, right, is uh, just kind of to reiterate the point you were talking about, where this would be kind of what results results uh bob would see right if alice if we grouped these so that alice that all of these up arrows are alice's results and this particular theta is what bob chooses to measure on average right he'll have eight different trials on average he will measure cosine theta but in each individual trial he'll get here a plus one a plus one a minus one a plus one a plus one a plus one a plus one and a minus one and the average of those matches the correct value of cosine theta but each individual trial is specific, right? Right. And doesn't doesn't have to respect that. I mean, this part kind of strikes me as kind of a duh. I mean, like, for instance, if I just flip a coin once, it's either going to land on heads or tails, assuming it doesn't land on the side, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't really tell me anything about the chance of heads or tails. Right. I, I have to keep flipping it over and over before it starts to average out into one half one half right so where we're currently at is oh okay if i choose to hold conservation of angular momentum across the average then i can reproduce quantum mechanical results and if i say oh okay i have uh, quantum mechanics acts like a coin then of course i know to push the averaging the, the the conservation onto the average but the question is why should I let quantum mechanics act like a coin? Why can't I have my spin particle be a fractional value of its rotation? Why can't I measure, you know, the, the perfect. Why don't I get my, my filled in pattern results for the stern Gerlach instead of the discrete output? Right. Right. Cause in, in, classical mechanics right one of the things that we always get to rely upon is that the conservation principles we come up with are held on a trial by trial basis because of physical phenomena right conservation of momentum is held on a trial by trial basis because the sum of forces is equal to zero light rays take the path of least time because refraction at the interfaces between media follows Snell's law and Snell's law, right? Forces those rays to respect time more than distance. The constraints hold on average because they can hold on a trial by trial basis. But here we don't have a trial by trial basis. We are forced to ask what is the principle that forces us into this, you know, coin flip situation for quantum mechanical systems. And, you know, what we're effectively doing is we're in the process of describing really well the physical phenomena, but we don't have a way of explaining why it is we have to force the conservation onto the average as opposed to the individual trial basis. And it's, it's a very similar situation to what Einstein found. There's a wonderful quote as he's trying to develop special relativity. And he says, quote, by and by, I despaired of the possibility of discovering the true laws by means of constructive efforts based on known facts. The longer and more despairingly I, or despairingly I tried, the more I came to the conviction that only the discovery of a universal formal principle could lead us to assured results. So effectively, what he's talking about is he's talking about the notion of space and space contraction and time dilation that we were discovering in the data and constructing a description of how to of how that behaved but we weren't really able to provide a reason why there's but with special relativity when einstein finally had his insight there's no mention of how it is that clocks go about slowing down or why meter sticks shrink instead the 
theory does not come about describing in detail each phenomena that makes it up and that's seen and to, cons and to try from there construct a coherent theory. Instead, it's the principle of special relativity that each observer measures the speed of light at the same value regardless of their reference frame that dictates that clocks have to slow and meter sticks do in fact shrink to match that principle. And that principle approach, that idea of here's a principle from which I can derive the rest of these things, has led to one of the strongest theories that we've ever made, right? One of the strongest theories that humans have ever uh, devised. And so the argument, it was in order to explain and answer Merman's challenge, to be able to have a strong picture of what's happening here, we need to have a crisp physical principle that doesn't rely on saying, oh, you respect this thing based on the average, because that doesn't tell you why the universe forces you into that position, right? Does that make sense? When I flip a coin 20 times and I get an average, it doesn't tell me why the average is one half? Mm -hmm. I know the average is one half because I know the structure of the coin itself. Right. I can make a, I can make a crisp statement that, oh yeah, a coin has two heads, so of course there's an average of one half, but there's only one side that I can see at a time, right? My coin only lets me see one side of the time because it's structured this way, because it's structured like a coin, right? And I'm sure there's a bunch of people trying to figure out how they can see both sides at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this paper I found from Stuckey propose that it's the no preferred reference frame that is the principle that directly explains the most simple empirical facts and answers Merman's challenge, right? So, and no preferred reference orientation. Right. Right. So, so here, the, the notion of what a reference frame is depends on the experiment you're making, mm -hmm. right? For a measurement of events or, or velocity or, you know, speeds, then the measurement you're making is going to, the preference frame that matters is going to be your relative velocity. Right. In the quantum mechanical thing, the thing, the way that you're probing the universe is with this stern girl, like the orientation of the stern girl. -like. So let's say for a moment that we have the spin equals one case and Alice happens to uh, align her or her stern girl, like along the entangled direction. So in the case that we've been saying, it's along the Z direction. And in doing so, she measures that there is a plus one. Right, so she knows that the particle she receives is in the spin up direction, and she happens to have correctly guessed the way the the orientation that the particles were entangled along. Now, in addition, Bob makes his measurement six degrees off of what Alice's alignment is. Now, what that would mean is then Bob's outcome would need to be one half in order to conserve angular momentum. But in this case, we would instantly be able to tell that Alice measured the true spin of the entangled particle, while Bob only measured a component of the true spin if in his right. experiment he got a fractional value. And what that would mean is that Alice's stern girlike orientation would constitute a preferred reference frame. She would have insight into how the particles are truly oriented. But this is precisely what doesn't happen. Alice and Bob always measure plus or minus h bar over 2 for the results. There's no fraction because no reference frame is preferred. The um, When we are measuring a universal constant, mm. we are forced to measure that value. So discreteness comes from no universal reference frame. Right. I see. You have a physical pref you have a physical statement that the universe says whenever I measure a constant of the universe, I will get a distinct value. It's the principle that explains special relativity, and it's the principle that will explain quantum mechanics. Right? And I mean, unintuitive results are kind of the bread and butter of physical, like modern physics, right? The idea that you and I experience time differently based on how we're moving or based on, you know, whether we have two different uh, velocities. The consequence of the relativity of simultaneity, the fact that Alice and Bob can partition space time, you know, in accordance to their reference frame and have a, create different versions of what simultaneous events are happening. 
And even weirder that those different descriptions of what's simultaneous are equally valid. This is directly analogous to what we had when we were partitioning, right, the the data results for those for the uh, ah, correlation functions, right? When I chose to partition according to Alice's results as opposed to to Alice's results plus and minus as opposed to Bob's, right? That partitioning are count as basically the the uh, simultaneity for quantum mechanical events. They are different pictures of reality that are equally valid according to this principle. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's satisfying, especially if you're comfortable with special relativity. You're, you're just kind of used to this concept anyways. Yeah. So there are uh, a couple of notions, and it's really... <laughs> now falls into the line of you know people the the the, arg, the ongoing argument about how we should interpret quantum mechanics right there are people that like weinberg who suggests that perhaps the fact that we can't understand you know what happens in quantum mechanics because there's there's no argument as he says quote there's no argument about how to use quantum mechanics only how to describe what it means. So perhaps the problem is merely one of words, but on the other hand, perhaps the problem of understanding measurement in the present form of quantum mechanics may be warning us that the theory needs modification. Like there are some people that look that, you know, we can't come to an idea of what it means, that maybe the theory is in fact wrong. Right. Right. And Merman is like, nah, such modifications. Merman writes in response, Quote, such modifications are motivated not by failures of the existing theory, but by philosophical discomfort with one and one or another of the prevailing interpretations of that theory. Mm -hmm. End quote. Right. It's the idea that, you know what, we should trust that the little bit of picture that we have from this theory is correct. We should be focusing on what idea, what picture of the universe leads to that theory and not what can we do to change the theory to make you know, our comfort with that theory better. Like, for example, I personally have a little bit of a peeve with the many worlds interpretation. Right. Just because to me it seems wasteful. <laughs> but obviously it's more complicated than that. Yeah. And really that's, uh, at the end of the day, the core argument that Stuckey and his colleagues make in this paper. Um, effectively, what it uh, kind of endorses is this interpretation of what's called cubism, cubasian inter, uh, cubasian statistical interpretations? Basically, our laws of physics uh, can, at best, give us what we should most expect on an individual basis, but they can't truly clamp down what things should be. E effectively, because you can't get a fractional value of a constant, there's a fuzziness to it. And this principle of no preferred reference frame is entirely in line with that. Merman, who, again, developed this whole challenge to explain what happened, viewed that cubism that, you know, human beings are, in fact, part of the world. And so our functions, even measuring physical systems, should be account, will have to be accounted for in our theories, uh, is the correct way to interpret what quantum mechanics is telling us. And there's, there's a, a lot on the different interpretations of quantum mechanics. And I think... Another time I'll go into that because they are really interesting and really cool to just kind of know on a level. But what we have here is a the end of the argument of the paper, which is that we can understand what's happening by simply saying the, the same thing that led to our crispest understanding of large scale behaviors, right? That again... That, that line of physics is the same, that there's no preferred reference frame to observe physics, right? That led, you know, in the original scientific revolution of Galileo saying, no, 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 no. We should have a heliocentric model, not a geocentric model. Because why would it act any different than when I look up at my telescope and see how Jupiter and its planets orbit each other? Why should physics be different anywhere Else, why should it be different here than anywhere else that I look in the universe? Why should the, anyone else measure the speed of light different from any, any other observer? 
The events that relate the two depend only on their relative velocities, not to some preferred true reference frame of the universe. And here, we can explain the strangeness of quantum mechanics, which basically forces us to conserve things on the average level, just not on individual trials. That's it. And the reason that you are forced into that position is because the universe says no. No matter how you measure it, you'll measure Planck's constant. Right, and you're only getting a, a piece. Yeah, that's it. And this is, I mean, so, so I think it'll be interesting to see how the scientific literature develops around this, who, how people start to argue it. But this is a paper that came out a few months ago. So this is a bit of insight into the scientific process of seeing, well, here's a proposal and how people will respond to it will be an interesting ex, uh, exertion in the future. Indeed. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. This only came out a few months ago. Cause yeah. It, not to diminish the magnitude and effort of the work, but it, it kind of seems intuitively obvious if we already understand special relativity that that if we're we're having this problem of conservation of angular momentum when we're trying to resolve these you know discrete flips that maybe we're just also not getting the entire picture. Yes. That that we're, we're, we're putting too much weight on our own measurement mm -hmm. yeah. and not that of any other observer. You'll find remarkably how just incredibly often it is that when you're doing research, when you're trying to figure out a problem, how you'll get stuck on a, a problem, you'll get stuck on something that you're trying to figure out. And the solution will be something that you look back and go, why didn't I see it? And the moment I did see it, it takes 30 seconds compared to the years or months. Sounds like your average integral. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is something that I run across in my own research when it comes to getting, you know, density of states for figuring out phase transition stuff. How to often write the literature in my field prefers the partition function and I need its, its Laplace transform. Doing that Laplace transform often can be difficult. If you go about it the right, the wrong way. Right. But if you have a key insight, I was like, oh, wait, oh, I should have just done this one thing. Maybe the slightly harder way or the slightly easier sloppy way. Interestingly enough, either one can end up being the correct result. But if you kind of are like, oh, no, this is the way I should try it. This is the way I should think about it and are stuck trying to say, no, in principle, I should be able to figure this out without exploring other options that or even thinking that there are other options that you'll be blinded and spend so much time and effort in something that's ultimately the wrong way to do it. I think that what we are seeing is a modern example of exactly that. It's something that's obvious. It's like, oh, okay, I can just think about constants of the universe being these, these special things as far as the universe is concerned when we try to measure them. And that forces me to have the averaging, right? Because we knew right, the... The fact that forcing conservation on an average level, I believe, is something that's been known for a good while, a few decades at least. Um, but the intuition that, oh, I can explain this by just saying Planck's constant is Planck's constant no matter how you measure it, is something that's new. Because no one thought to apply the pr thinking of special relativity and, and let's, to quantum mechanics. Let's be clear. Did the stern gerlach machine is measuring Planck's constant, but if we had just taken a single result, we might get an in incorrect value of Planck's constant. But we understand that if we average over time, or if we reconcile the two different results that people are getting, not not a because you're not. It's not about Planck's constant that you're measuring. Like the spin up, spin down, the difference between those two, mm -hmm. right? Of a particle, actually, not even the difference between those two. The amount. Right. If I send a particle along a straight trajectory, the amount that it will deflect up or down, just a single result, doesn't matter, is determined by Planck's constant. Right. right. And whether I expect my particle to spin up or down depends on its spin orientation. Right. And the like what we were talking about with Alice and Bob and that spin one, if Alice happens to guess the correct orientation that the source has entangled the two particles in, the direction the, the source has entangled the two particles in, let's say the Z direction, when Alice measures, right, uh, that she gets up, 
Bob measuring, say, uh, 60 degrees off of that, not in the X direction, but, you know, just a little bit, just a little bit off of that. He should, because he's getting a spin down particle, should only get a little bit of deflection. Right. But instead, he gets the result that he does, right? Over over the course of many trials that would be like that setup if he measures 60 degrees off, right? Right here. And Alice consistently gets up, spin up, happens happens to get spin up every time. The average of Bob's result that we see here on the screen, right, will equal what he should get for to conserve momentum. But any individual deflection will still be the will give him the exact result of Planck's constant. Right. Okay. Right. So each of each of these guys, right? This will give me if I, you know, because Bob will say, "Oh, okay." The the distance that this is deflected gives me Planck's constant. The distance that this is reflected gives me Planck's constant. The distance that this is reflected gives me Planck's constant as well, just in the negative direction. Right. right? Each of these gives me the deflection gives me a measurement on Planck's constant and gives me the exact value of Planck's constant. And because the universe says, no, you can only measure Planck's constant, you can only measure plus or one, right? You have a most one bit worth of data, then he's forced to either measure Planck's constant in the up direction or the down direction for his stern like machine. But on average, he will measure a fractional, you know, value of Planck's constant. Make sense? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. There you go. This is the work of Stucky et al. Answering Merman's challenge with the idea of conservation per, per no preferred reference frame. Go How physics. That <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Anytime, bud.